Hi everyone, you're in for a treat today because I'm here with Max Mantilla, the founder and CEO of The Alt School. Thank you so much for being with me, Max. Thank you for having me. So I had so many angles that I wanted to start our conversation off with. And the last thing I did actually for my research was watch a couple videos that you guys recently posted on your blog where the students are saying what they think about going to the alt school. I was completely blown away by their reactions, especially when one of the middle school students said that school shouldn't be a place that you're forced to go because he loves going to the alt school. Can we start out with you taking us through the day of a typical alt school student, perhaps using one of your daughter's playlists? Yeah, so uh, my daughter is actually not a student at the school uh, until kids turn four years and nine months. They're by law, we can't have them in elementary school. Um, so my daughter will be here a Very year soon. from now, but uh, but not yet. You know, my niece and nephew are are here now, and I can walk through. Um, you know, for for a student in the lower elementary classroom like my nephew, or in the upper elementary classroom like my niece. First off. You know, there isn't exactly a standard day. We have a very wide uh, drop-off window, you know, 90 minutes plus or minus, depending on the location, and a very wide pickup window, you know, three hours, uh, even longer in some locations. And when a child arrives within that window actually depends on not just that child, but that day. And the idea is that there there is certainly a core part of the day. It lasts from approximately 9 to 3 p.m. And within that time, children are working together in a classroom setting, often leaving the classroom and, and uh, complementing the learning experience they have in school with what the rich communities around San Francisco and in places like Brooklyn and Palo Alto that we're expanding can afford. And what's crucial to us is that Kids have long blocks of time, you know, multiple hours where they're in an interdisciplinary setting, where they're working on their own or with other students or with the whole class, and where what they're doing maps to what they individually are working on and the ways that they are motivated to learn. And a specific example is, you know, in, a, in an upper elementary classroom, you might have a group of students who are building a historically accurate and scale accurate city block from San Francisco in 1906 in Minecraft. And those are students who might be, you know, as much as two or three years apart in age, but relative to the things that they're working on, they're appropriately matched by level for that project. And you know, they are able in an interdisciplinary context motivated by the things that interest them to work on, you know, their ability to estimate, their ability to research, their ability to plan and collaborate. And what's very important for us is that we create an environment where students and teachers and parents can really change the experience on a day-to-day -day basis for what each individual student is is interested in and motivated by, but also what they need to learn. And this idea that a personalized education can be more rigorous and more transparent and less of a free-for-all than uh, traditional education is something that we very deeply believe in. So can you explain in light of that how the portrait plan and playlist approach works? Because I know that each student has the ability to explore different areas they like while still reaching those high level objectives. Sure. So, uh, you know, first off, at a high level, alt school is about creating a process of continuous improvement. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from Bill Gates where he said, we tend to underestimate what we can do in 10 years and overestimate what we can do in one. And, and I think that that's really essential for a child's education where you, know, you take a kindergartner, they're going to be in school with you for 10 years. And the worst thing is to overestimate what can be done in a year and constantly be frustrated. And at the end of a decade, they've gone to school for 10 one-year frustrating periods instead of one 10-year period where you are appropriately ambitious in terms of the incredible things that a child can do. And I think that it also relates to kind of how we see 
our development as an organization where this is about a 10-year journey. You know, my one-and-a-half-year-old is going to graduate from alt school more than a decade from now. You know, I have a 10-year vest. Our CTO has a vest through 2025. You know, that's the kind of horizon on which we're working. And so a lot of these things that, that I'll describe are the kind of first step towards creating a different model of school that, you know, balances between the things that you really want to be small in a school experience, individualized, customized, dynamic, intimate, and the things that you want to be large. The, the brand, the resources, the best practices, the data, and, and finding a way to kind of stitch together these individual experiences into a coherent whole that gets better and better over time is the kind of essential aim that we have. And when we talk about the kind of core of that experience, it is the way that a student learns in the classroom, where for each child we want to understand that student and we want to, in an extensible and individual way, describe them. And that's what we talk about as the learning portrait, where we're able to say these are the things a child is interested in and this is where they are across these dozens and dozens of different learning progressions that they're working on and milestones that they're tracking towards. And then that portrait can inform the plan that we have working with the student, working with their families as to what are the things we're prioritizing right now. For, so, for this child, it's, it's advancing to what would traditionally be a kind of fourth grade milestone in their writing and a third grade milestone in their reading and a fifth grade milestone in their, their estimation abilities. And that idea that there's no such thing as a third grader and that each child is going to be actually, you know, plus or minus potentially a very large number of years in terms of where they're at and, and that level that they are together with the things that are really important to them and their family should, should inform a different plan for one child versus another, even who are the same age, even in the same classroom. And then the last piece of this is when we talk about those two things, the portrait and the plan coming together in that playlist of about 20 to 25 curated activities each day, where you might have kids working in a whole group or in a small group together, but each of them is working on something that maps to who they are as a student and what they're prioritizing over you know, that month and ultimately that year. And What's essential is that when a child finishes a playlist item, like, you know, the project that culminates in them building a catapult, that that project isn't just done, that playlist item isn't just get done, it gets assessed by the teachers. And we're constantly giving this formative feedback. We're not waiting until the end of a month or the end of a quarter or the end of a year to say this is kind of where you are. We're constantly able to evaluate that, you know, ultimately working towards being able to evaluate this in real time. So getting back into things, just hearing you say that makes me reflect on something you said in an interview with Jason Calcanis, that you've become a process person. How has that mentality driven your work at Alt School? Because it really seems that every day is different and you guys embrace that. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's starting from a very different premise than I think most organizations or most kind of products are conceived around. And it's this idea that, you know, we're just always trying to get better and that, that never stops. And when you talk about something like education, I think it's essential to have a dynamic experience. I, I, I don't believe that there is an education experience that's going to be optimal for a child today that's still going to be optimal for a child 10 years from now. And, and it's one of the things that, that A, attracted us to this space because we thought this kind of iterative, agile, user-driven, data-driven process really had something to contribute. And it, it, it makes you kind of reconceive everything from, you know, the notion of a school where we have a networked model. Kids don't belong to one location. They happen to go to a classroom for, you know, some number of years even. But then that's going to change. Eventually they're going to, you know, 
move from a lower elementary classroom to an upper elementary classroom and, and their family will have the ability to say among all of these upper elementary classrooms in this location or in other nearby locations, what's going to be the best fit for my child? Uh, moving from you know, one classroom to another, thinking not just about what's the curricular flavor of that classroom, but also you know, who are the other kids they're going to be with? Who are the educators they're going to be with? You know, what are the what are the extracurriculars that are that are offered in that location versus another location? Or what are the kind of community resources that match, you know, what they're interested in and what they want to focus on over the next phase of their life? And that looks much more like the working world than it does like a traditional school environment. How do the different locations differ? So, you know, first off, they differ a lot in size. You have kind of uh, a modern one-room schoolhouse like this that's co-located with our office. Um, you know, you you have another location that, as I said, has four classrooms or another that has three classrooms. Um, you know, they have different advantages relative to each other. You know, so the three-classroom space has a great outdoor area. The four-classroom space, you know, borders on Fort Mason and has uh, amazing kind of parks and community resources that are around. Um, you know, the, the, we have a school where there's more of a kind of emergent um, curricular experience versus, uh, you know, other locations where you know, there might be more of a STEM focus. We're opening a Spanish immersion classroom next year. And so you you start to see this kind of general purpose approach for opening and operating schools in this networked manner and delivering a highly personalized education to kids within the classroom, taking on some very different forms, not just in terms of you know geographies from Brooklyn to San Francisco, but also in terms of, of you know, different flavors of experience that children are going to have in in one classroom versus even another classroom in the same location, let alone a different location. I just thought I think that's one of the things that gets me most excited about your work is that you built it like a startup in the sense that it's scalable because that way you can make a real impact on education. As a CEO, how are you leading the team to not only be so agile in the expansion aspect, but to keep the I don't know if it's data driven exactly, but to merge data and learning together in the way that you have. So, you know, I, th I think that that you can unpack kind of how does a system evolve into one, you need to have change be relatively easy to accomplish. And key to that is being able to change one thing at a time. So this is this is one of the greatest challenges that we have in the traditional model of education is that if you want to extend the school day, well, you need to change teacher compensation, right? You need to change the busing schedule. You need to change the way that rooms get assigned. You, you know, there's all of these other things that also need to change and it becomes so interconnected that it becomes almost impossible to change every, anything. So the first thing that you need to do is just make it possible to change one thing at a time, right? To change what this student is working on or how they're being assessed or, you know, who is teaching them or what the schedule of the day is without having to change every other aspect of the experience for everyone else. And then the kind of second piece is, okay, now that it's possible to make changes, you need to be able to measure what is the effect of a change. You need to be able to determine what are changes that aren't moving you in a positive direction and be able to course correct very quickly. And you need to be able to measure what changes are moving you in a positive direction direction and not only continue to do that thing but actually propagate that change as broadly as you have similar situations that warrant that would benefit from that new way of doing things and and your question strikes at kind of how essential it is to be able to understand okay I've changed something is it good or is it bad right does it improve satisfaction? We measure student, parent satisfaction and employee satisfaction monthly at a very granular level. Does it improve standard-based results? We're kind of constantly measuring what is the progress children are making on standards-based learning progressions. Does it change costs? Right? We're able at a very granular level to see what are we spending money on, 
right? And, and do the things that we're spending money on actually contribute to satisfaction? Do they actually contribute to better results in a standards-based way? And you need to kind of, with that data, piece together, well, what are we trying to accomplish? It's not, it's not unambiguous about what is better or worse. And in fact, for some people, one thing will be more important than another, and that's fine. But you need to be able to reflect back to you know, different educators and different students and different parents, you know, this is what the effect of this change is. And, and be able to do it on a very fast time scale. Because you know, if you find out at the end of a year that something that you changed had a negative effect on you know, a student experience, a year is way too long. Right? You want to you wanna shorten that time scale to, as, to a minute. You know, to to an hour, maybe a day, but but even a week is is a long time in the life of a child to be kind of doing the wrong thing, and and also being able to provide data, being able to provide transparency into this is what you can kind of expect by implementing this change. It's essential for anyone else across the network that would follow in the footsteps of you know, an educator or a family that had some kind of success. Two things that really strike me about that. I love how you said, how did this impact a student? You said student singular. No one in the education system right now is focusing how on how a change would impact one student. When it comes to a student either showing or telling you that something didn't work so well, what are the next steps to change it to do it so quickly? So, you know, let's let's take a specific example. A student is um, is you know going to some third party packaged curriculum provider like Singapore Math, and they're doing a math lesson. Well, they're going to finish that card, and they're going to be asked to reflect on, you know, was that a good experience for them? That card is going to go to an educator, and they're going to see did this child actually demonstrate proficiency in this thing that they were practicing. And, you know, you can take those two inputs and you can very quickly say, you know, this did not work for this student. Let's not give them more of the same. And you see this manifested in, you know, just the overall way that we think of assessment, which is probabilistic. We don't say this child reads at a third grade level. We want to be able to say, you know, we think if tested today, this child would have, you know, a 60% chance of demonstrating third grade level proficiency in reading. But that's a 60% chance that they will, is a 40% chance that they won't. And you know, we might have two students that we would both say they have a 60% chance of demonstrating competence at the third grade level. But it's plus or minus 30% for one of those kids and it's plus or minus 10% for the other. We're much more confident in our prediction for student A versus student B. Well, you should behave differently for those two students. Similarly, if you have a student that, you know, is at a 60% likelihood of being able to show proficiency at a third grade level in reading, but they've had like 500 hours of reading at a third grade level, that there's something wrong there, right? That is an order of magnitude more time than that student would probably need focusing in that area to do it. So it should, they shouldn't just get more of the same. And that's reflected, you know, literally the next week, if not the next day, in the playlist of activities that that student is going to have. And similarly, when a parent says, you know, like, I don't think my child is getting enough reading or I don't think my child is getting enough foreign language, we have specific things that we can come back to that parent and say, okay, you know, they can be taking this extracurricular instead of that extracurricular. They could get more of this kind of playlist activity than that kind of playlist activity. Here are the consequences of that, though. And is that, is that a trade-off worth making? A typical school can't engage with that level of flexibility because they haven't kind of used technology to systematically bring down that cost of being more flexible. It's prohibitively expensive in terms of not just money, but time and energy and risk for a traditional school to say, okay, we can, we can change this. We can, we can allow you to go to school for longer or less time or give you more homework or less homework or you know, allow you to take this extracurricular or shift to that extracurricular or literally move from one classroom to the other classroom mid-year. You know, all of our kind of experiences around a transfer experience. 
So kids don't kind of all start school the same first day of school. They each independently come into a classroom when it makes sense over the course of the year for them to join and they'll move on to another classroom with some group of students when it makes sense for them to move on to another another classroom. You're getting me so excited about this because it touches again on that network that you mentioned that there's different classrooms students can go at different times. Eventually this is going to be on a global scale. Once you do that how are you going to scale the company with the same personal interaction between the student and the teacher? So, you know, at this point, we don't, we don't get in the way of that at all. The, the teachers in the specific classroom have tremendous autonomy about how they kind of vary the experience for each student. But they're using a consistent set of building blocks to vary that experience so that the work of a teacher in one part of the system is reusable by another teacher and so that we can take the kind of engineers that we have where with 50 engineers, you know, that's it's more engineers than pretty much any elementary school system on the planet and we can have them build things that everyone across the network can actually benefit from in a, in a clear and concrete way. And by not kind of inserting ourselves, I mean, there's no local administrators at all school. There's no notion of a principal or an assistant principal. Kind of everything that is outside of that classroom is, for the most part, centralized within specialized teams that are able to provide real estate support or support in dealing with, you know, parent communications or support in dealing with teacher career development in their own kind of specialized technology enabled way versus what you normally have which is each school needs its own principle and the quality of that principle which can be enormously varied directly determines the quality of the experience for everyone involved and that principle has to do you know 50 different things they're not specialized around any one skill so it's really then the the data and the engineering side that's laying the foundation for the teachers to have that interaction with the students in so many different places now. That, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the purpose of old school is to allow us to be more flexible <laughs> and that flexibility directly translates into you know, the personalization that a student experiences or the autonomy that a, that a educator has in crafting the experience for a specific set of children or the kind of way in which we can offer a flexible service to parents and say, you know, as your needs change, even down to like where you live in the United States, we can continue to serve you and we can, and, and, and that, I don't believe is possible to do in a scalable way without using technology to make it feasible to be more flexible. And, and one of the beauties of technology is that if you hire engineers to build hardware and software, then the more people you serve, the more engineers you can hire, and each of those engineers builds things to benefit everybody. It's not divisible when someone creates a piece of software. And, and you end up with these experiences in the 21st century where the more people use that search engine or social network or you know, watch that blockbuster movie, the better the experience is for all of those people. Right? That's a 21st century notion of quality that comes from scale versus a 19th century notion of quality that comes from scarcity. And and what we're endeavoring to do is to kind of fundamentally shift the model to one where quality comes from scale. It doesn't come from scarcity. In terms of scale down the road, is this something that some of the technologies that you guys are developing that other schools will be able to use? How are you going to spread the message beyond the all schools in particular? Yeah, of course. I mean, we're, we're creating an operating system that is very, very comprehensive in terms of what it allows you to do around an education experience. And we're starting with building that for ourselves so that we can really iterate with the maximum surface area and with the least restrictions and we can demonstrate for others that this actually can be transformative. And ultimately, you can take an operating system and you can provide an end user experience the way that Apple does, or you can take that operating system and you can 
give it to partners, give it to others to kind of build on top of. And ultimately, you know, we will have by far the most scale in terms of the students that we serve through existing schools, not through schools that we start or even kind of old school like schools that others that partner with us start. When it comes to the engineering side of things, you've been leading engineers your entire career. How is this different than your time at Aardvark or your time at Google? You know, I mean, it's a, it's a much bigger enterprise. It's a much longer term enterprise. It's a much more cross-functional enterprise. I mean, we have uh, educators and operators who are, you know, in equal parts driving this experience alongside of us. And that's different than in a lot of the kind of tech endeavors I've been a part of where, yes, of course, we were building things for different kinds of users, but they weren't literally you know, in the room with us at the time we were building it. And so those, those things are very different. When it comes to that cross, cross functionality, how do you enable that with your teams? So the educators and the engineers, how do you bring them together to discuss? I mean, one way is you literally just bring them, <laughs> bring them together. Co -like, you co-locate a school with your office and it brings people together. You know, you, you have teachers spend extensive amount of time outside of the classroom environment. You have people from, you know, the office spend extensive amount of time in the classroom environment. You have the kind of service like school where, you know, many of us who work at alt school are parents of children who go to alt school and so you're experiencing it from both sides you hire people who have a passion and experience for education outside of you know classroom roles and you hire people who weren't necessarily educators to work in the classroom and you kind of cross pollinate in that manner and you also you staff user research, you create processes, so you're getting this kind of continuous feedback loop. It, it doesn't happen on its own, even with proximity. When it comes to your team in particular, I'd love to take a couple minutes and chat about the educators that you're bringing on board. Last I saw, you had over 2,000 applications for 20 spots, right? That's right. So when you have that kind of incoming interest, it obviously validates what you're doing. How are you evaluating those candidates? What is an ideal educator for, or is there an ideal educator for all school? There's not, there's certainly not an ideal educator in the same way that there's not an ideal student. You know, the, the experience is going to be very varied classroom by classroom and location by cla location. Certainly when you think about an educator at a certain level, you're looking for certain qualities. So for a junior educator, you're, you're really looking for whether or not they can create a supportive and thriving classroom environment. It's largely a, a social and emotional, not just an academic capability that you're looking for. As you get into, you know, more, more kind of um, mid-level educator, um, with kind of five years of experience, six, seven, eight years of experience, where most of our educators are in that kind of seven, eight years of experience um, uh, band, it's, it's having a capability for academic and non-academic excellence in terms of the learning that they're, they're helping to cultivate in their students. And a, a ability and a willingness to be collaborative in a meaningful way. This is all about building on the success of edu other educators and contributing to the success of other educators and not just being an island, you know, with your co-teacher in that four walls of a classroom uh, that you have day to day. And as you get into kind of more senior educators, um, you know, folks with 10, 15, 20, in some cases, 30 years of experience, you're looking for people who really want to shape the culture and direction of uh, a school. And in this model where they're not the administrator, they're not the principal, they, they still teach every day. And, you know, they may even have a specific classroom that they're responsible for, though most of the time they'll kind of co-teach with all of the other educators in that various location. But, but they will 
have a different kind of connection to the parents in that location. They'll have a different kind of connection to kind of the, the engineers that support that location or the central teams that support that location. And they will work to kind of define a particular way that that school operates that's different than the way that any other alt school would operate. And so we're looking for, for folks that have vision, that have a capability for kind of operational and not just pedagogic excellence. For a teacher, Max, who isn't working at all school or a school similar, what are some ways that they can integrate this type of model for their students? Because I know there's a lot of teachers who want to do these things but are restricted by the traditional school system. You know, for the, for the near term, you know, we continue to be very heads down and build something for ourselves. We don't have something yet that we think can be really transformative and, and work externally. It's something that'll take us a number of years. And we're interested in partnering with educators externally, even at small scale, so we can start learning as soon as possible. What are the things that are different um, in, in you know, schools that, that have existed for a long time, but that could still really benefit? from some of the things that we're building here. I, I think that you know, there, there is always an ability, no matter what school you're in, for an educator to take a partnering approach with their students and to you know, ask questions versus giving answers, to think about kind of what are the assumptions that they're making and test those assumptions to ask for feedback, to ask students, how am I doing? You know, we, we measure stat student satisfaction very, very regularly. You don't need a lot of software to measure student satisfaction and to ask and get feedback, but it's a very tough thing to get feedback and to use it and build on it. But, but it's something that anybody could do immediately. And it, I, don't, I can't imagine anyone in education or outside of education, I can't imagine a CEO that isn't going to be better if they are getting more feedback and if they're working on their ability to, to react and grow from feedback. I love it. So before we go, Max, can we end with the highlight of this journey for you so far? I, I think the highlight of the journey has been a number of families moving back to San Francisco and not moving out of San Francisco because their children kind of came to alt school. That, that for me has been the first glimpse of what I think we can ultimately do, which is, which is to create an experience that can kind of bring people in and fundamentally change their lives. And, you know, it's, it's amazing to do something that has such a large potential impact but that out of the gates is, is, is transforming the lives of students and families in that way where these, these, are, these are families that wouldn't be living in San Francisco if they didn't have this school. And I think that's, that, that feels different even than, you know, obviously the, the incredibly impactful and incredibly motivating confidence that any parent puts in us who sends their kid to alt school. And, and it, that first year, it was incredible that we had 20 sets of parents, you know, choose old school, literally take their kids out of a different school or send their kids to old school rather than somewhere else. That was, that was an enormous deal for us to say, you know, this is what we want to do. We actually are going to commit to this over a very long term. And this, this past year, the kind of next step of that was literally seeing not just families send their kids to school, but, but move to send their kids to alt school and not move away from San Francisco, you know, when they had school age kids because there was the school that they felt really met their needs. I think that's the perfect way to end it. I know you guys are expanding so there can be other families who attend alt school. How can everyone stay up to date with where you guys are headed next? You know, we, we do our best to, on our website, through our blog, you know, give all the kind of most recent news and, uh, and ultimately, you know, we're, we're always incredibly open to people emailing us for information and asking for us. And, and it may take us a long time to kind of get to your neighborhood or, or have something that can really, um, 
compliment the work that you're doing as an educator or an administrator, but but we want to get there and we want to hear from from everyone that 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 is part of this space and that from one direction or another cares deeply about preparing kids for the actual future that they're going to experience. Great. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you.